that this is the third one of these events. The next one, tell your friends, will be at the uh, Holland Center on Thursday night. So that'll be the last one of the initial outreach group that we're going to do. I'm going to turn it over to Ann. She's going to tell you a little bit about the library and thank you for coming. Hi, thank you. Just a quick welcome. Um, because of COVID and I started at the end of September, a lot of people haven't had a chance to meet me. So I thought I would say hi. I'm Ann Johnson, the new executive director here at the library, and we are thrilled to be open again to the public. And we'll be launching a whole slate of programs um, in September. We have a couple going on now, but we uh, have to really expand our offerings in September. So welcome back. If you don't have a library card, they are free to any resident of Maricopa County, and we can get you set up with one of the front desk. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Okay, again, thanks to all of you for taking some time today and you know, coming by for this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, a little bit of a presentation to kind of bring you up to speed on where we're at in the town, what's happened so far, where we're going, and all that. I'm encouraging questions. If it's something real important, I'll answer it right then. If not, I'll give you a plenty of time at the end for questions also. And so don't hesitate to ask those. Everything's open. Everything's on the table. There's nothing that's hidden. Um, also, all of these and all of the council meetings that um, we've talked at and I presented to, including the budget ones, are all available online. So if you want to go back and see what's happened in the past or look at something in the past or look at how the town did their budget process, you can do that. All you have to do is check into the town website and all of these are there for you. Okay? So with that, we'll kind of get started a little bit. Here's, here's kind of what we're going to go through today. Um, I'll give you an introduction. I'll talk a little bit about myself. I don't want to do that too much, but I am. I'm not an official Cape Creeker, but I'm an honorary Creeker, so I'll go over that, that type of stuff for those of you that live out here. Um, we'll do a background in history, and I have why now? Why are we doing this now? How come this is going on? Why do we need to do it now or not need to do it now? We'll go through all that. The preliminary goals and options that were given to the council were given to the town saying this is what, what we found out and then what's next where we're going so again as we go through this process um, everything all the final decisions are end up being made by the council i'm not a policy maker i'm out here and i'll explain why i'm out here and how i got here but i'm not a policy maker the policy maker is going to be the town it's going to be the town manager and town council so they're the ones that most of this stuff has gone to first and now we're trying to reach out to the residents to make sure you understand what's going on that makes sense? Is that okay? All right, so first background and a little bit of history. Um, initially, rural metro covered the entire Foothills area, both Cape Creek and Carefree, the North County areas. It was done by a fire station at Tom Darlington and Cape Creek Road. If you remember the little shops down there, the little strip mall, that was there for a lot of years. Uh, Carefree ended up building the station and then almost at the same time, Cape Creek uh, put a fire station in rural metro, rented the old car wash. And so then we had two fire stations. You have the one in Carefree and the one that we're currently located. That was in about 2005. Um, initially, when they first moved out here in the county areas, it was all subscription. It means you had an individual contract with Rural Metro. The town was not involved in very many ways at all. It was actually individual contracts. Um, since that time, Cape Creek is still individual contracts with Rural Metro. Okay? Carefree has a master contract with Rural Metro. It gets renegotiated every year, or not every year, but every few years. But it, here in Cape Creek, it's still individual contracts. All right, so it's voluntary. Only 40 to 45% of the people and businesses in Cape Creek subscribe. So what that means in my mind is that half of the people are paying the whole tab. Everybody's not put in, everybody's not done all that stuff. So that's it's a little bit of a challenge in my mind, and I'll explain how I am. I forgot to explain that first. And then again, the master contract, and then we'll have a discussion as we go through with this with mutual aid and automatic regional aid. Now, let me back up just a second. I, start, I said I'll start with introductions. I didn't start with introductions. My name is Jim Ford. <laughs> I'm the deputy fire chief with the city of Scottsdale. Um, I worked with the city of Scottsdale Rural Metro at the time for 30 years. And then when Scottsdale transitioned from the city, from Rural Metro to the city of Scottsdale Municipal Department, I was part of that transition team. I was a fire chief officer at that time. So I've been there for almost 47 years. I've been in the fire service. Um, I came to Cape Creek to assist Cape Creek um, after some of the stuff we're going to talk about happened. Cape Creek and the town of Scottsdale, Phoenix, and Daisy Mountain, the area reached out and said, we've got to do something. 
Uh, my chief loaned me to be free. I'm on an inter intergovernmental agreement, it's called an IGA, between Scottsdale and Cave Creek for me to work for the town of Cave Creek. Okay, and I've been out here since December. So that's who I am. Uh, how I'm familiar with the area, we built my dad's house out here in 1971. My dad has lived out here the entire time. I have a brother, I have a cousin that live out here. I had other cousins and other brothers that lived out here, but they moved. But those guys still do. That's why I say I'm an honorary creeper, I'm not an official creeper. I don't live here. I live in the, the, in the city of Scottsdale where I currently am employed. So I'm very familiar with this area. I've seen it grow. And as we go through this, what I want you to remember is this is not the same town that it was years ago. It's not the same town that a lot of us moved here initially years ago. It's growing up, it's becoming bigger, it's becoming more dense. We're about, and I don't know the exact numbers, we're about 6,000 people now, 6,000 residents. I think it's about 38 square miles. So the town has grown dramatically, the, town, the population's grown, the businesses have grown. So it's, it's still Cave Creek, but it's not the same Cave Creek. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this, okay? And what does the town need to do as we go forward? All right, so I probably had to back up and do a little bit of introduction, but this is kind of where we're at. So this is the history of how the service, the emergency service has been provided out here and where we got to. And again, we'll talk more about mutual aid and automatic aid as we go through this. So major incidents, what seems to happen out here is a major incident occurs, things get talked about, everybody gets worked up a little bit, and then something either happens or doesn't happen. In the past, often it hasn't happened. The Cave Creek Complex Fire, if you were out here in Cave Creek at that time in 2005, that's right when we were doing the transition from rural metro to the city of Scottsdale Fire Department, started in the north part of the city of Scottsdale. I was on that fire, I helped with that fire. We turned it over to the National Guide as fast as we could. But that ended up at the time being the second largest wildlife fire in Arizona. Now it's the third, there's been another one that's passed it. But it's still the third largest wildlife fire in Arizona. Started in the desert, started in this area. And so if you were in Cave Creek at the time, you saw that and you could see those, those flames and that mountain on fire from here. That's how big it was. Then we have in, other individual ones that I just put up there just for discussion purposes. The Buffalo Chip Fire was a pretty big fire around Thanksgiving in 2015. The East Desert Fire, the Ocotillo Fire, Feed Store, Cake House Fire, we'll talk about those a little bit. The Buffalo Chip Fire, what's interesting, and this will start on the mutual aid automatic aid stuff, if you look at the pictures of the Buffalo Chip Fire, which some people have and they're online if you want to go see them, you'll notice that there's two ladder companies there. You have a big fire, you have a major structural fire, you need elevated streams to help you control that. You'll know there's two ladder companies at the Buffalo Chip. Um, because of mutual aid, because of the agreements that were in place at the time, one was from Scottsdale and one was from Phoenix. So those were not local resources. They were not raw metro resources. They were Phoenix, Scottsdale said, yes, you can use our our elevated streams, you can use a specialty equipment. Okay, so that's what the, the Buffalo chip needed at that time. When we had the big wildland fires last year, the East Desert fire was in the beginning of May or middle of May. The Ocotillo fire was near the end of May, it was two weeks later. We had those two fires back to back. Everybody, not everybody, tremendous amount of resources from the region came to help. If you watched all that, you had the air tankers from the state, you had the rural metro units that were available for the communities. You had Phoenix, Daisy Mountain. Daisy Mountain responded initially because of the size of the fires and called in assistance. Daisy Mountain was able to call for the automatic aid resources, which is the rest of the valley, that came to help with that. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. You had the tunnel forest there. You had everybody there because that was such a large fire. Almost 1,500 acres. Several structures were threatened and some burned a little bit. Then two weeks later. We had the second fire and the second fire was about almost a thousand acres but you had more structural damage because it was more into the town and the same group of people sent the same resources which you need for those kinds of fires you need the, the access to those resources so you did not just do the mutual aid which is sent in one or two trucks if you need assistance you impacted the automatic aid system which is the whole north part of the valley and we'll talk a little bit more about that but that's what occurred back to back with those two fires. Feed store fire actually happened the same same time as the Ocotillo fire. And the Cake House fire was the, one of the most recent ones that happened in Carefree. And again, that was a mutual aid situation. Rural Metro sent their resources, called for mutual aid. The mutual aid came from Phoenix. 
said that they already had a water supply, and then that mutual aid left and left the, the fire up to rural metro to handle. Okay, we'll talk about what it takes to handle those fires in just a little bit. But the point is, when something big happens, you're going to need assistance, and how are you going to get that assistance, and what's going to be that process to get that assistance? That's one of the things that I'm looking at when I came out here. So again, mutual aid says, and it's currently with rural metro, we have an incident. Can you send us additional resources? They call Scottsdale, they call Phoenix Dispatch, they call Scottsdale, Phoenix or Daisy Mountain, say, what do you have, can you send that? And it's optional to send the resources, yes or no, if they can. They don't have to, it's optional, they can do it. Most of the time, with the fire service, you're gonna get something. You're gonna get something, at least initially, but, but that's an optional request and it has to go from a dispatch center to a dispatch center, it's not automatic. Okay, it's not mandatory, it's not required. The automatic aid system, which is what the rest of the valley is on, which is Phoenix, Scottsdale, Daisy Mountain, Tempe, Glendale, is all dispatched by one community center, one major dispatch center. The vehicles are located and they'll send the appropriate resources immediately. There's no, Phoenix doesn't call Scottsdale and say I need resources. Daisy doesn't call Glendale and say I need resources. The dispatch center makes that call initially. As soon as something happens, the dispatch center does that. Okay, you understand that difference so far? You have to request it versus it's automatic, okay? It's not optional. If you've been approved as a member of the automatic aid system and they call and say, we need your engine, you're sending your engine. It's an actual contract. It's an actual intergovernmental agreement. So why is that important? The National Fire Protection Association has standards. They're the ones that set the standards for the industry, for the fire service. The standard for response in fire departments is 1710. And you don't want to read it because you'll go to sleep. I read them all. It took me a long time because I kept falling asleep. <laughs> but yeah, they're very detailed on what you should and what you shouldn't do. So 1710 says for suppression resources for a standard 2,000 square foot residential house, typical standard, whatever you want to call it, you should, it's classified as a lower hazard event. Even though it's, it's an impact for those people, but it's still classified as a lower hazard event. But as a lower hazard event, your effective minimum response is 16 people. Right out of the gate, you get a call for a residential fire, you're supposed to send 16 people. On engine companies, on ambulances, on ladders, the time sheets, whatever it is, you're supposed to send 16 people because they broke it down. And that's one of the handouts in the back if you want to pick it up. They broke it down into what number of people you need for the different options, the different operations, okay? You need this many people to vent, you need this many people to attack, this many people to do search and rescue. So it's 16 people, 17 if you have a ladder. And for all the valley here, you usually get a ladder with all the first response. Usually it's three and one. Is this like a guideline or is it the compliance that fire departments should be doing? It's the national standard that fire departments should be doing. Right. And there's, there's no penalties if you don't. Okay. You know, it, it, it does turn back into the local community. Do you want to meet the national standards? You don't want to meet the national standards kind of thing, okay? There's no penalties if you don't, but that's what you're going to be graded on. When they come and grade your community, the insurance industry grades your community, they're going to start with 1710, okay? So when they do that, that's how it's going to happen. All right, so that's how, that's your initial response. That's what's supposed to happen for a typical single family residential, all right? So let's throw in out of the normal calls, the big incidents that you had last year. There is no standard response for a major wildland incident. As the initial folks get there, the people get there, they take a look at it, they start calling for additional resources. We'll talk about the resources that, that went to that. But you're gonna call in what's available and what you can get there. First you had, again, your, it was initially a mutual aid, Daisy Mountain and Rural Metro responded Daisy Mountain called for automatic aid, Rural Metro called for their assistance with mutual aid. But almost 1,500 acres, and that was a major, you saw it. We, we got all the way up to bringing in air tankers. <coughs> Same thing happened two weeks later with the Ocotillo fire, almost 1,000. This one actually got into structures, but you're still calling for those additional resources that are available. And when they come, then you have, we'll talk about a little bit about it, but they have to leave their areas that they're normally protecting, right? And you're calling that amount of resources. So I put this map up and this is just for reference purposes. 
those are either one of the two fires you can look at. They were both in the same area. All of the red dots came from stations from the surrounding areas. These are all, these are Scottsdale stations, these are Phoenix stations, these are Peoria stations, these are Daisy Mountain stations. All of those stations in the north part of the valley sent resources to Cave Creek. Okay? They said, yeah, we'll come and help. This is a major incident. We'll come and help. And they sent all those resources. Rural Metro sent the Cave Creek and the Care for units down, and then they called for their backup units, which were from, um, who knows where the next closest Rural Metro unit is, not Cape Creek or Care who knows where the next closest one is? Real Verde. Real Verde, down off the of Dynamite. The next one after that is Fountain Hills, okay? So that's, that's where they're coming from, So they call for assistance. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But all of these stations sent resources to the, all those calls. All of them sent it, and they did it twice. They did it twice in two weeks, okay? So with the automatic gauge system, what happens is they automatically start moving trucks from the other part of the main valley up to help cover this area. You won't have the same coverage, but they'll start moving other units into that. Um, how many of you, about two weeks ago, you had the big fire in Phoenix, the recycling plant fire. They said, this is the biggest fire we've ever had. Um, Scottsdale units moved to downtown Phoenix to cover. This Phoenix tied up so many other units down there. That's how it automatically works. It's you know it's not a request. It's they just move and they just do it. So, so you're saying that if you're not on the automatic aid or control, and you pull those resources north, it doesn't automatically cover where they're coming from. The automatic aid system is going to automatically cover for their automatic systems. Right. What we're going to get to is the automatic aid system has notified the town, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. We're not going to commit like we did in the past. So, yeah, but what, what I guess what I'm asking is that when that happened, you're mm -hmm. saying with automatic aid, they, they'll cover where they're pulling resources from, but right. that doesn't happen with mutual aid. Not necessarily, no. Yeah. Okay. With mutual, everything with mutual aid is a request. Okay. Everything is with, our, we're, we, it, it could happen with, let's say you have two major car accidents, then you could either pull another mutual aid unit in or another automatic aid unit in, but you have to request that. You have to say, give us those units. Or can you give us some units? It's a, it's a request. It's not a automatic dispatch. But in this case, you're describing they did it. So did they send the bill? How does that work? Um, they actually did send the bill. <laughs> they actually did send. We can talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, they did send the bill to Cape Creek, and uh, Cape Creek did pay it out of their savings. Um, they usually don't. If you're part of the automatic aid system, there's no bill. But they did at this time. We'll talk, we'll talk about that just a little bit more. So anyway, I just wanted to show you the impact of the whole north part of the valley for those fires that we had in our community. So let's go back a little bit and say, how did we get here? And why did we get here? Why are we doing this? Why is the town looking at this? Well, in 2008, those of you that were here, there was an initial report, our initial citizens committee that was put together to look at the fire service. Do we need to stay with what we're doing? Should we do something different? Have that discussion? Should we contract or not contract? And uh, it came up with several recommendations. I don't put them in here, but you can get them if you need them and want to see them. But the advisory committee came up with recommendations and at the time, the town manager did not move forward with that. Nothing changed. Nothing changed in 2008. So then we had the fires last May. The first thing that happened after the fires last May is the town manager got phone calls from all the other communities. From Scottsdale, from Phoenix, from Glendale, from Peoria, from Daisy said, thank you, we don't, we're a fire service, we're gonna help you, but we can't no longer commit the resources that we committed if you're not part of the system, all right? So that's what initially happened. She got that phone call, said, you need to do something. So the first thing that the town did is they hired a third party to give them a quick report on this is where you're at, this is where you need to go, this is the evaluation of the town. That was the Kevin Roach PSRM report. That's in town. You can have it if you need a copy of it. We can get you that. And that basically took a snapshot and said, here you are right now. Here's where I think you're going. After that report came to the town, then the town manager got an official letter to her from the city of Phoenix but basically representing all those other communities, specifically saying, if you don't change, we're not coming in the same manner. 
And they didn't say, I want to make this clear, they did say we won't come, but they're not going to come in the same race number of resources. They're not going to commit the same number of resources. They're not going to have that impact on their communities that they had in the last two times. Okay? So don't, everybody's confusing me a little bit, but I'm not saying they're not coming. I'm saying they're not coming in the same manner. And in fact, the, the difference is now with mutual aid, if something was to occur, they would request it, and both Scottsdale and Phoenix and Daisy all wrote letters saying, we're still going to help you. We're still going to come if it's a life safety issue. But once the life safety issues have been addressed, then our resources are going back to protect our communities. Okay, that means they're not going to stay for overhaul. They're not going to stay for all the cleanup and stuff that you need to do. Okay, that's going to fall back on your local resource unless you turn into a part of the automatic aid system. Okay, does that mean uh, like reignition? Once the event is dealt with, but there could be a reignition. They're not going to stick around. For that. No, they're not going to stick around. And the, the K House, the reason I put that on there is because that's a, a classic example. That was a working fire on the south side of the southeast side of the mountain over in Fairbury. And Rome Metro responded. They attacked the fire. They asked for assistance for water supply. Phoenix sent assistance for the water supply. Once the water supply was established, and he says, you got that, there's no life safety issue, we're going to go. And they left. They left it up to Rome Metro to put the fire out and do everything else that you're talking about. Is uh, life safety all the difference between like structures being threatened versus wild area? The wild area not be life safety? Life safety is life safety. If you have a vehicle accident and you have to cut people out and need yeah. assistance, they'll send in help with that. If you have a house fire that's reported with people trapped, they'll send okay. people to assist with doing the rescue. Once that the, the, the structure has been evacuated and the people have been rescued and, and treated and transported, they might or might not stay. It's going to be up to the guys on the scene. What about area that there's no structures but there's a wildfire that would be not very safe? That, that would be a decision at the time of the request. Okay. What what units they have or don't have, um, but they're not committed to come. They don't have to come. Okay. Okay. So that's yeah the wildland stuff. I don't know. You know, the, the, the different departments, again, the fire service, they're going to help. They might respond for initial attack, but if they see this is going to turn into a campaign fire, which is what those are considered campaign fire, mm -hmm. they probably won't be staying. Okay, does that, that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Answer your question? Okay. So the town got the official letter from the city of Phoenix. Rometro got the letter from uh, the Phoenix Fire Chief of Rometro saying, we're changing our mutual aid, we'll come and assist initially, but we're not going to commit our resources. Scottsdale just signed a mutual aid contract, but it says we'll come and assist for life safety, but we're not going to commit our resources. Daisy Mountain wrote a letter to the town, not to Rural Metro, that said we will come and help the town because we know you're doing stuff, but we're not going to commit our resources on any type of official automatic aid or mutual aid system. Okay, so that, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. That's why this is such an important deal. So in December, the town, I mentioned, got the IGA with Scottsdale for me to come in and you know, look at what happened, look where we're at, look at the history, and, and talk with the council about where we need to go with that. So this is just the meetings that have occurred. In case you go onto the website and you want to look at them, February 16th was my first presentation to council, saying here's my initial findings. Um, March, April, April was also the budget, May with approval, June with the approval. So we go from here's what your options are to here's what it's going to cost you because fire service isn't cheap. I'm not <laughs> trying to tell anybody that this is a, you know, we can do this quickly or cheaply. You can't. So I'm trying to make sure that everybody understands what the resources need. <clears throat> so again, all of those are on the town website if you want to go see them. So here's the primary goals. What I was tasked with and I confirmed this with the council. Again, no, the council's the policymaker, but I'm just, a, I'm just an old fire guy that's out here messing around trying to help you a little bit. But the council's the policymaker. And so I was here to evaluate the use of mutual aid versus the regional automatic aid. To look at the impact on the automatic aid system. What's it going to take for the town of Cave Creek to become a part of the automatic aid system? Which was one of the directions the council gave me. Tell us what this is going to mean. Tell us what this it takes. So we look at that and then we look at the community options. 
what is the current protection model? What are some other options for models? And again, look at the regional impact because those letters are very clear. And if anybody wants a copy of those letters, just make sure you sign the thing in the back and Kelly will get you a copy of all those letters. We'll send them to you. You don't have to go through the um, public records request process. If you sign up, we'll send a, a packet of the letters so that you can see what I'm talking about. So we looked at all that stuff. So the first thing that I did as my task was to, again, you have to evaluate what's the risk of the community. Obviously, the key for your risk is, one is EMS, emergency medical services. Okay, that's probably 70 to 80% of the calls is emergency medical services. Then you have structural risk, and then you have your wildland risk, and you have impacted all of those this last year pretty dramatically. So I looked at the risk, I understood the risk. Then I started reaching out to everybody that was a stakeholder. Initially, I went to the Rome Metro and I talked to the Rome Metro chiefs and said, how did this work? What happened? You know, what, this is how I'm gonna do this. This is how I work, this is how I operate as we go through this process. Then I started reaching out to everybody else that you see on that list. Every one of those was a stakeholder, the Department of Forestry and Fire Service, the FFM, the PV Town Attorney, because Paradise Valley was in a similar situation. Paradise Valley owns the resources and contracts with the city of Phoenix to provide the staffing and manpower to cover Paradise Valley. A lot of people don't know that. It's a separate contract. Yes, I know that's one of the options on the table. I heard. Yeah. How's that working for PV? Um, they just signed another new 20 year contract. They like it. They like it. They started it in 2005. They went 15 years and they just signed a new one with uh, five year renewals. Well, it's a 20 year contract. They will review the contract every five years. Um, actually, Deb, Debbie Robertson used to be a Scottsdale attorney. I know her quite well because I was the fire marshal in Scottsdale, so I had a lot of contact with attorneys and counsel on a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was happy when I saw she was working. I worked for PV, and they just, I didn't have their new contract too. If somebody wants that, I can get that for you. But they love it. They love it. Um, I talked to the Arizona Fire District Association director, John Flynn. We'll talk more about that. Talk to the county. We talk to all of these fire chiefs that pretty much, well, not everybody on there, but most of them sent resources. Peoria even sent resources. Mesa was impacted by those fires because they had to help move up resources. Obviously, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Daisy Mountain, and Glendale were the four biggest ones that were impacted because we took all the resources from the North Valley Valley. So I talked with every one of them and said, what, what do you need? And the answer is pretty simple. The answer is, and we heard it when we had the Zoom meeting, uh, Carrie, the town manager, and I had a Zoom meeting with the League of Cities got involved with this. We were doing some talk about doing some legislation, but the League of Cities got involved. And we had a Zoom meeting with all of those communities to say, here's what we're doing. I sat with her and said, here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going. Can we continue to work on this? And they said, yes. But when we talked to those folks, the message was, it's time to be a player. You're either, you're either a partner or you're not a partner. You know, we can't continue to carry you. We're not going to be your de facto fire department. Is basically the message that, that we got at the Zoom meeting and, and the that's what the letter said. So again, that that ends up shifting back to the town and saying, okay, what are we going to do as a town? <clears throat> so just so you know how I did this, the methodology is I knew this was going to cost a lot of money. It's, it's not cheap. There's, there's some major decisions that have to be made here. So everything that I did, everything I presented to town, and it's all on the records there, is what it's going to cost. Here are the estimates. Here's how I broke it down. All of that stuff was given to them, and we're still talking about costs and estimates as we go through, even though the budgets have been through already. But there's three primary areas that has to be addressed. You have your one-time startup capital costs. What's it cost you for a Fire station and fire truck for all the equipment that you need, set gear for the firefighters, all the hose, all the uh, emergency monitors, all the stuff with the EMS. What does all that cost to start up? Because remember, the town of Cave Creek had nothing. The town of Cave Creek was a blank sheet, blank sheet. All right. Paradise Valley, you mentioned them, they built the fire stations and they owned the fire trucks. Carefree, the master contract with Carefree, they built the fire station, they owned the fire truck. They own most of the equipment. Cape Creek owns nothing yet. Okay, we don't own anything yet. We're still a blank sheet. So those guys have different advantages on, on reaching out and have, making a contract. They have different advantages because they already have some resources. They already have skin in the game a little bit. Okay, 
So who owns what we have there? Private owner. Private, private owner. owner. And it's leased. I think that actually leads me to the question. If I know if we're getting ahead of ourselves here, okay. but if the town of Cape Creek, which is different than PV, mm -hmm. population, geography for sure, how close uh, properties are to each other, all that kind sure. of stuff. Sure. But uh, there's a rural metro building and all those facilities that the town of Cape Creek decided to either own or operate. Could they buy it all or could they continue or, or, or lease it and then do another lease to all the other, and not a lease, but a contract with everybody else using that facility as a first basis to build a farm? Give me two minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, give me two minutes. <laughs> we'll take a look at that. Just, I just want you to understand the basics before we go on to that, that discussion. What I've heard from the other discussions and what we heard when we started doing this when I got out here in December, and you saw this, the reports in the paper, is that Cape Creek has money and they have money in their savings account. Why can't Cape Creek pay for this? So there's a huge difference between capital, one-time costs, and your ongoing costs. So Cape Creek does have money and have savings for the capital costs. When we went through the whole exercise and experience, there's money that the town has that can do that. The challenge is ongoing and operational costs. What's it going to cost you to run that fire station, have those those full-time firefighters on, and do that all over and over every year, starting whenever you start? Okay. So there's a big difference between one-time capital and operation. You can't spend all your capital money on operational money. You have to be able to make sure you have the revenue sources to do it. So that's what we that's what the budget process was. And that's what the last one is, the funding and revenue sources. Everybody needs to understand where can we get that money and how much is that going to be as you go forward. So those are the financial decisions. So here's, this kind of goes to what you were talking about. This is what was presented to council on my initial findings. Is here's some options that the council can do. Now I'm not saying that these are all good options. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, but these are all options and it's all options for the policymakers. And so the first one is they don't have to do anything. They didn't do anything in 2008, okay? They don't have to do anything now. They could stay status quo. But understand, if you don't do anything and you stay status quo, then there's consequences, okay, which I talked about a little earlier. So every one of these has a, you know, a benefit and a kind of a, an impact. Did you have a question? Yeah, about that 2008 report, I know I voted on property tax for the fire service. I came from some report. That was probably the 2008 report. I don't know if they put it out for a vote or not. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So kind of the, the history is missing that part. That we've had this discussion before. It went to the voters before and it failed. Okay. So I'm not trying to call you out as being wrong. I'm just trying to say there is a little more history here. Than, okay. Uh, on the second time you said it, somebody had to say it. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, point well taken. I'll include that. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know that it went to a vote before. I know you've had property tax votes before, but I didn't know it was for the fire service. I know you did it for Spurcross, and that, that you paid for that. And that's not 2012, was it? Was Spurcross 2012? No. Um, our vote was in 2012. and, and So the report was in 2008, and you didn't vote till, 2000, till 2012? Yeah, I think so. I, I thought it was earlier than that. But I mean, Maybe 11, but not before okay. that. And people that didn't have structures on their land complained, well, why would I want fire service? Well, that was debunked last year when they were bombing the hill behind my house with a DC-10. That leads me to another point or question here for you, Jim. On the 40 to 45% covered by rural metro subscription, what percentage of those are for undeveloped land that is covered by rural metro subscription? I don't know that. Rural metro. So we could have 80% of the undeveloped land without any kind of subscription coverage, yet there's somebody here to put out a fire if there's a fire on their lot. I, yeah, I don't believe there's many. I don't know that they contact you to do a contract for undeveloped land. Most of their outreach is for uh, structures. Yes. And uh, most of the contracts, and, all, and again, I was with Rural Metro for 30 years before I switched over to Scottsdale for the last 17. But all the contracts that I've seen all say 
this is what it costs you for your structural protection. And by the way, we'll cover up the five acres of undeveloped land that you own next to it. So if you're on a five acre plot, we'll cover that with it. But I don't I don't believe that they have very many. I can ask the question whether or not I get a response or not, but I'll ask the question. I don't believe there's many for just vacant land. I don't think hardly anybody does that because I don't know that Rural Metro reaches out to them to ask them to tell you the truth. So the 40 to 45 percent of us that are paying our subscriptions are actually covering all the raw land or undeveloped land potentially because they're not asked. They're not asked to do it. You're paying for the the resources to be here. Right. The 40 to 45 percent are paying for the resources to be here. If rural metros to respond to a non-subscriber, the rules are the, the process is they would then build that non-subscriber. How often they do that and what revenue they get from building, I don't I don't have that and they won't do that for me. But so in theory, if if something started on a subscriber's piece of property, rural metro should be able to cover that and should be responsible for it. If it's, it's on a non-subscribers, they should be building them back. And you know, for the resources and responses, and that's all included in their bills. You know how much they charge it per hour and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Did that come into play with that fire that occurred on the Acatillo? Was that a subscriber that had insurance coverage? That's still going to go to the courts. Um, my understanding is it was a subscriber that extended, and then the discussion is it extended into non-subscriber property. So. Who's responsible? We didn't have time to have make those decisions or have those discussions. I wasn't here, but that's what that's what the discussions were, and that's why it's still it's still in, this, in some cases. Okay, that didn't stop everybody from coming and trying to. What the subscriber non subscriber thing had no impact on the resources that came. It had no impact on the way that that fire was fought. It's just that's kind of a secondary thing to it. Okay. So again, first option is remain status quo. Second is the town could require memberships of everybody in town and set up a, a billing process. This is what Paradise Valley did. Everybody, they build everybody in the town of Paradise Valley. They all send their money to the town. They collect the town and then that pays for their fire service. The legislature and their wisdom has said, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> they passed the legislation said you're not allowed to make do that. So Paradise Valley is the last one that could do it that way. But the town could say, Everybody has to be a subscriber, and then between the town and rural metro, figure out a way to make that happen, which would then lead to a master contract with rural metro, similar to what Jeffrey has, a master contract. Okay, but you have to get into the whole billing process and, and that. So you're still talking about 55% of your people that, are, that need, would be impacted. I um, heard a lot about this: create a new community or a regional fire district, or annex into an existing fire district. And we got. You know, some folks from Daisy Mountain here, and they've been in that discussion a lot longer than I have. Um, I, that's when I called the Arizona Fire District Association said, okay, what would it take to create a new district? And we went through the process. You have to go through the county, and you have to go through the state, you have to get the signatures, you're on a specific time frame. And I asked him, when was the last time that a true new fire district like this occurred? And he couldn't even give me a, a day. He said, I don't know. The last ones have just been the very small 20 home county island ones. That have been in contract with the community next to it. Um, I said, so what are the chances of either Cape Creek on its own or Cape Creek and Carefree combining for a regional fire district and then getting that passed? And he basically said, you're going to, you would waste over $100,000. You'd waste over six figures to do it and it won't pass. It won't happen. The last big one that they tried was the rural metro area, the East Pineway between Scottsdale and Rio Verde, that whole area out there. Um, rural Metro supported it. Many of the bigger community members out there supported it. They did the whole process. They took the time to do it. They spent all the money. They did all the advertising, and it cost the town in flames. Do you know why? Nobody wants to uh, pay. The, if, if you do a fire district, which I'll talk about in a little bit, if you do a fire district, their only source of revenue, or the primary source of revenue, is property taxes. So everything that they do has to come through property taxes. And I'll show you that in a little bit, how that works. That's that's not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that's their only source. The difference in the advantage that the town has, which we'll, we'll talk about, is the town can use other revenue sources to offset those. If you do if you did do property taxes, they could also increase sales tax and things like that. 
Daisy Mountain, for example, is a county area. They do have uh, Anthem in their, their fire district. It's a very large fire district, but they don't have the ability to do sales tax or anything like that. Everything has to be paid through the property taxes. And so that's what the cost is when you look at that initially. Now that doesn't matter if you do a new district or it doesn't matter if you annex into a district. It does, that doesn't change. So if you were to annex in, the requirements are the same and the outcome is still the same. So you would be paying, as an example, like the Daisy Mountain, you would be paying the Daisy Mountain Fire District uh, no rate or tax rate. Okay? And I'll show you that in a little bit. The option was to develop and install a standalone Town of Cape Creek Fire Department where you hire a chief, you hire some uh, EMS directors, captains, you hire personnel. If Cape Creek was to do and, and jump off into this, okay, we're going to do our own fire department, they would almost double the size of the current town as far as employees and things like that for the people that you need okay just for for the one initial station we'll talk about that a little bit for one fire station i think i i kind of went past that for one fire station one engine company is four people you have a captain there's also your initial incident commander okay you have a battalion chief that will help cover the area too but you have a captain you have an engineer a driver and then you have two firefighters and the way that our system set up here is two of those four are advanced life support paramedics and that's because 70 to 80 percent of our calls are ems calls emergency medical calls so two of the four are medics and you have to have a, a, a medical director you have to have your, all your stuff set up with the state to do all that that's okay but you have to have a support group to do that you also have to have your training captains you have to have the people to make sure your guys and gals are, are trained and operating properly all of that is the support stuff. You have to have a human resources department that can test and, and do all that. So if we were to do our own, you would double the size of the town. I can't, it's not very good. Right. <laughs> okay. And so they, the discussion was, I don't know that we need to do that because we do have another option. Another option is contract with an automatic aid provider. Do a master contract. Have the town purchase a fire station or build a fire station, purchase a fire truck, purchase all the equipment, all the advanced site support equipment, own the stuff, you know, be a partner in this, and then contract out for the services with somebody that already has that in place. Daisy Mountain already has all that in place. Phoenix already has all that in place. Scottsdale already has that all in place. But you have to contract with somebody that's adjacent to your town. We have three options. What won't happen is you won't get all three communities bidding against each other that's not going to happen they're all partners already so that's not going to occur so you would need to contract with an automatic aid provider if you want to be in the automatic aid system okay and even then when you do that you put everything in place then we still have to as the town and as the department providing the services we still have to go to the region which we'll talk about and say can we be a partner in the automatic aid system you know we have the radio systems in place all the different stuff can we do that? We accept us into the system. Okay, it's not automatic. Is it accept in advance? What? It, it accept in advance the concept or put everything in place and then ask. I didn't understand. Yeah, we would have to. We would have to tell that to show the commitment that we've done this. We've reached. We've done and you know, put everything in place and then ask the region to say we're in. So it's a bit of a gamble. Not much of a gamble. Okay. It is a bit of a gamble. Okay. The region very much wants the foothills area to be a part of this. Okay, they understand. The region doesn't want to have the impact that we had last March. Yeah. What would be a region? What would the region, why would they not say yes? What would be a region? You might not have the radio coverage in yet. You might not have four person staffing. You might not have uh, two medics on the truck. You might not have the training for your, your folks, the guys and gals that you hire to protect this area, you have to have the regional training so that they're all <coughs> operating the same. Okay, so the, the theory is, I'll back up just a little bit for automatic aid. The theory is, if we have a fire on, let's say, Home Depot, Carefree Highway, and Cape Creek Road, that's in the city of Phoenix. The Cape Creek truck would respond, Scottsdale truck would respond, Phoenix truck would respond, Daisy Mountain would respond. But they're all trained and they all operate almost exactly the same. There's four training academies in the valleys currently. There's um, Glendale, 
Center for Peace at Mesa, or the four training academies. Everybody has to go to those one of those four training academies. As big as Scottsdale is, almost 250, 300 people, 16 fire stations, all of our folks are still going to Phoenix or Chandler or Glendale. Okay? And so everybody's trained the same. And then your captain and then your ins big incident commander, your battalion chiefs, are all trained the same. So a Scottsdale GC can command that Home Depot fire on Carefree Highway. And all the Phoenix guys are going to know how he's going to do it. The Daisy Mountain chief can command that fire, and all the Scottsdale and the Phoenix guys are going to know how to do it. It's all, the training is all consistent. Okay, there's basic training that you can get and that you have, but then there's the regional training to make it consistent and make everybody else even better. The uh, option to develop and install standalone sounds expensive with the staffing, but it also sounds like a very small fire department. What, what would the capabilities be even if you hired all those people? The capabilities to be in the automatic aid system don't change. And so, so, so that's, that's, that's the minimum. But I mean, how could they actually handle what goes on here in terms of the real fires? It just seems like small. That, this is just a start. We're starting. <clears throat> All the discussions have been what are we starting for and then what's going to happen yeah. to, as Cape Creek continues to grow. And that's part of the challenge that we have. Um, the challenge, again, is the black sleep slate that we're starting with. But if, yeah, if you were to install your standalone, again, you, and, and one of the, one, a person brought up to me, they go, well, how come Collison is in the automatic gauge system? Collison is only seven square miles. Why are they in the automatic gauge system? Well, they're primarily commercial industrial and Tolleson has one fire station but because of their risk in their area that one fire station has a chief officer has a battalion chief responder has an in full staff engine company a full staff ladder company a fire prevention officer a, a outreach public education officer and then staff so for that one seven square mile station because it's mostly industrial they and their budget runs probably about six million or more a year for all of that, for one station. Now, the, the difference is everybody says, well, why is Tolleson in there? Tolleson is primarily, primarily the ladder truck for the Southwest Valley. Phoenix doesn't have a ladder in that area, and they don't need one because they, they know that Tolleson's going to come. Goodyear you know, or Litchfield doesn't have to have a ladder because they know Tolleson's there, and it's close enough that they can respond. So that's the advantages of the automatic aid system. You can get the resources from the whole region from all 20 plus <clears throat> departments that are in the region. If you need helicopters, or if you need ladder companies, or you need hazardous materials teams, or you need special rescue teams, all of that, even if you don't have it internally, because it would cost you more to have a special team here, the region's gonna have that and be able to bring that to you. Yes? From your experience, does it seem to, it always seems to function? Um, is there any time where it's denied? Or because it's being run by human beings, is there any time where they're like, yeah, I don't like those kind of scenarios? And I mean, have you seen any reason why it starts to break down? People are people, but the system doesn't break down. Uh -oh. Kelly, can you turn my phones off or whatever? Take it off. Sorry. <laughs> Smart people come up. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, it, this has worked this way for a long time, and it's actually started with Phoenix and Tempe and Glendale. Mm -hmm. It's grown to over 20 departments, and so rarely does it break down. And it won't break down on an emergency incident. If there's issues on the incident, then they have the ability to talk after them and say, hey, your guy's on engine, I need to discuss that once it's open there. Your guy's on engine 614, we're rushing up on it. So you haven't seen it become politicized? No. In fact, um, in, in a lot of areas, uh, Glendale Phoenix, for example, the west side, um, there's a Phoenix fire truck and a Glendale fire truck in the same station. Okay? If they needed coverage for both, they could have built two fire stations next to each other. That didn't make sense. They built one fire station, a Phoenix truck and a Glendale truck, if it's to the west, they pull out and turn right. If it's to the Phoenix, they pull out and turn left. If something big happens, they both go. But that's, you know, so it's worked out very, very well. The chiefs are the ones that run this system. And the, the chiefs hold this very dear to themselves. This is the second, and I never mentioned this at the other one, this is the second biggest single resource dispatch system in the country, only second to FDNY, Department of New York, because of the way it's seamless and the way it works. 
every unit has a, a vehicle locator on it, and it doesn't matter to, and that's part of the contract that you sign to get in. It doesn't matter if it's a Phoenix truck or a Scottsdale truck or a Daisy truck. It doesn't matter. Whoever the closest appropriate truck is getting dispatched and going. So if, you know, just say that if, if um, you know, I'll, I'll make it a little weird just so it sounds that way. But let's say we had a Glendale truck that comes to the Abrazo Center and drop somebody off and then something happened at Cave Creek and, and Carefree Highway. As soon as that, abroad, that Glendale truck was available, they're going to that next call. They don't automatically go back to Glendale. They're part of the system. They're gonna, they're the closest appropriate unit and they're going. If Daisy Mountain is over on the west side at Deer Valley and they drop somebody off and they have resources over there and then they start coming back and something happens in Phoenix, they're going to that call because they're all trained the same. And so, yeah, again, you'll have a little wall of maybe between an engine company here and there, not very often. I'm not familiar with a lot of it, but the chiefs won't stand for it. They don't stand for it. And, it, and again, it is a contract. It's a contract with every community. You all have to sign it. You have to have your label sign it. You have to have your concern, your uh, council and everybody sign it. So it's all, we're doing this. And, uh, and it, it's worked very, very well. Which is also why they're very careful in who they bring in. Okay? And that's also why you have to ask. It's not automatic. You have to ask if you come into the system. Yeah. I just wanted to say that everything that you said seems to me it's a culture, historical culture of cooperation. Mm -hmm. So the mindset is, uh, you know, all for one and one for all. But you guys, the greater you guys, are forcing Cave Creek, which I'm not saying is a bad idea, to make a decision because we're really not going to be that cooperative and one for all, you know, uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, to me, sitting here right now at this point, if I had to vote just from what I know in a half hour, it would make no sense to have a town of Cape Creek Fire Department, a standalone cost and everything else. No sense. It would make a lot of sense to hook up with a developed uh, group in a greater system of cooperation. You sound an awful lot like the Cape Creek Council member. Oh, well. <laughs> right. that's a new <laughs> but, but, no, well, that's, but that's just it. Like I said, all of these are options. How good of an option each one is. If you want to, if you want to go, I don't want to take up all your time today. But if you want to go to the the council meetings and look at it, each one of these has a whole other sheet of here's your pros and cons, and you talk about all of the different stuff that you're asking about. Say, this is a pro, this is a con if you do this option. This is a pro, this is a con. Each one of these has all that. I didn't want to take that time today other than to talk about it a little bit. But again, for the town, um, I, I relied a lot on Paradise Valley and to some extent Carefree. Carefree is a master contractor. Carefree, and they're discussing this right now too. If they decide to do something, they already have the groundwork. All they have to do is come up with a contract with the line Medicaid provider and then ask for assistance. So there's options for everybody. So here's just basic requirements. Everybody's saying, what is that? What does this mean? Yeah, you're kind of forcing us into this. And yeah, to some extent, you're right. But I think that the the situation forced the town into it instead of me. I'm just here telling you what, what it is. But the, you know, the, the occurrences is what got us here today. You have to be dispatched by either Phoenix or Mesa. That way they control who goes, and they make sure that they send the closest units. That's the automatic vehicle locator. It's a coverage resource management. They know they're going to get three engine companies and a ladder and a battalion chief on every structural call. You're going to get it. You're going to get the three closest ones, no matter what. So you have to be part of that radio dispatch system. They want the towns to have resources. They want the towns to say, yeah, you're, you're participating. This is not just one way. You know, we're not just going to keep coming to you. You have to have resources that you can support the system. That's the second part. Command training and response, we talked about that already. Everybody goes through the same um, dispatch and, and uh, training sites. Full staffing for NFPA, again, is four members per, per the NFPA. Captain, engineer, two firefighters, two medics because of life, advanced life support. And again, if I talked to my medical director, and I was in charge of EMS emergency medical services for Scottsdale for a while. And I talked to my medical director, he says, in the valley, 
the engine company and the equipment they bring is an extension of the emergency room. With the exception of surgery, those guys on that truck can do almost everything that an emergency room doctor can do. And they're not gonna be able to take the time, to just turn, you don't scoop and run anymore like we used to when I started. You scoop and run, try to get to the emergency room. These guys now go on the scene, they, they confirm, they stabilize, they treat, and then they transport. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's, there's two components. The fire service in the valley is your emergency medical response. If you're from back east like I am, originally from Pittsburgh, that's not how it is back there. But the fire service out here, the fire trucks, and the engine company is your emergency medical response, which is why there's four guys on there. The second part of that is your transport. Okay? Stabilize and treat, and the transport is the second part to get you from here to there. If you don't need to go in an ambulance, you don't need to go in an ambulance. You know, if you strain an ankle, somebody else can take you fine. But understand that if the mindset changed, and I've worked with this everywhere. These guys and gals are the ones that are going to treat and transport, or not treat and transport, treat and stabilize you first before the transport. When we call 911 now for emergency, where does that go? Does it go to Phoenix or? Does no, no, your original 911 call goes to the appropriate police department. So from Cave Creek, Carefree and Maricopa County, it goes to the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department then transfers it to Royal Metro for a response if it's a fire or a medical emergency. If it's if you get in the automatic aid system, then the call will go to the Phoenix Police Department and Phoenix Dispatch. Okay, it'll all the all the calls for Cape Creek and the region or whoever's in the in the region will go to Phoenix Dispatch. Phoenix and Mesa the region there's two of them. If Phoenix goes down, Mesa can dispatch. If Mesa goes down, Phoenix can dispatch. But all the calls will get, if you go into the automatic aid system, all the calls will get transferred for medical and fire will be transferred to the Phoenix dispatch system. So this is, when we had the Apatia fire, mm -hmm. there were also the riots taking place in Scottsdale Valley, mm -hmm. and Fashion Square. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that's, a, that's an overlap police fire response or something, whatever is going on. Sure. How does something, I mean, obviously everything is just being thrown at the fire up here mm -hmm. because of the nature of it being so close to buildings and all sure. But how does a, that kind of event interact if we had been a member of this group? I mean, how, because obviously resources are now being thrown all over the place. We got a riot going on, we've got, you know, people's safety, we've got obviously some arson, we've got, you know, so how does that, Kind of what that's, why, that's why it's advantageous for one dispatch center to be controlling that. Okay, so the Phoenix dispatch for fire and medical controls Scottsdale fire unit, so they know these Scottsdale units are tied up at this issue down on Fashion Square, so they're not available to respond. So they would go to the next closest and send them, but they know all that because it's all coming out of one center. Okay, the police is a, is a little bit different, the police doesn't work exactly like the fire does. And I don't know if there's any police officers in here, and if there are, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, but we work better than the police guys did. Yeah. <laughs> well, that being said, <laughs> we do get there first and make everything Some, safe. Sometimes, yeah, So to your time. point, if there's a riot, the policemen or the firefighters, even if there's like right. dumpsters on fire, they're not rolling in yeah. until the police say it's safe. safe. So it's kind of apples and oranges. The cops are still gonna do automatic aid to each right. other. Right. And, and then do. when they beat everybody up and get rid of everything, then they call the fire department <laughs> and then they do their thing. Yeah. And so, they, they did. They, the, the police in Scottsdale called for assistance from Maricopa County, but I don't know if they got much from them. They did get from Chandler, from Tempe, and Phoenix, all sent resources to help with that stuff that was happening down there. So it's a coordinated effort, but it's it's more coordinated if you're only talking with one or two control centers versus three or four more control sites. And you feel confident that that's not, um, I mean, we don't, we tend not to try to centralize everything too much, right? Because for good reasons, but you feel that in this case, it actually makes sense. It's actually, it's helping as opposed to uh, locating everything too much in one area. For the response side of it, which is what everybody's worried about, you don't care if it's a, a white truck or a green truck or a red truck that shows up to be a heart attack, right? Yeah, I don't care. I don't, <laughs> no, uh, let me say it might have a heart attack, not you. <laughs> if I have a heart attack, I don't care. And which, what color truck shows up. I just want the closest one that's going to have two medics and have the best chance of saving. And that's how this system is. That's what's so nice about the system. 
is for response purposes, there's no jurisdictional lines. For staffing and manpower and you know how you're gonna run your department and what this chief thinks and what this chief thinks, they all collaborate, cooperate, but this still Daisy Mountain, it's still Scottsdale, it's still Phoenix. But for response, the jurisdictional lines are gone. And that's because there's one dispatch center. That's because the call goes in and they say, who's closest? I'm just curious, because sure. I don't know. What if Daisy Mountain said, we're going to deal with everything east to Black Mountain? And Phoenix said, we're going to deal with everything north on the west side of Cape Creek or north side or whatever. And then Scottsdale would say, well, we'll take everything in this area. Uh, maybe that's ridiculous, but could there be, could we contract with Scottsdale for this area? And again, 90% of calls are medical. Um, could Phoenix do this much? And could Daisy Mountain do that much? Because if there was a conflagration, everybody would come anyway. I mean, and it, again, it could be absolutely impossible, but I just don't know why that could maybe be. That's a, that's a nice theory, but the issue is the town has to treat everybody in the town the same. Now, it doesn't matter on the response, but everybody in town has to pay into or not pay into the town's cost of the fire service. Cape Creek's not going to pay for Care Creek's fire service. Care Creek's not going to pay for Cape Creek's. Phoenix isn't going to pay for Cape Creek's. So the automatic aid system allows what you're saying to happen on the response side. But when you're in the political side of it and the, the community side of it, everybody has to be the same. So, so the people in downtown Cape Creek and the people in the north part up by um, Fleming Springs and the people on the west side all have to be treated the same. So you either charge everybody or you don't charge everybody. You can't break it up and say, well, this is what's going to happen on the west side. Daisy, can you can you contract with the folks on the west side and charge them this amount of money versus i know it would be contracting with a neighborhood it would be contracting with the town but they would understand if there was ems calls that daisy mountain would respond to those ems calls if they were available in these different areas it's just like having a police precinct in north portland and a police precinct in yeah. east portland and as we've already discussed, uh, fire department's a fire department. Everybody's the same. So, I mean, to me, you're not getting a less level of coverage because every coverage is the same. I think that's the discussion of where we're, we're headed with this stuff. Cape Creek might own the fire station and the truck and stuff. It's going to be the same trucks or very similar trucks to what, whoever we contract with, probably Daisy Mountain. Okay. And Daisy Mountain will put the staff in there. So it's not going to matter that the Cape Creek is owning and paying for this, it's still going to be the same guys that would come. Same with the west side. The Daisy Mount folks are going to respond to the west side when we do something over there. And on the east side, I don't know what Care Creek's going to do. But Care Creek's not part of the automatic aid system yet. If they decide to do that, then that will turn it either into Scottsdale or Daisy Mountain might serve Care Creek also. You know, those are options that the towns have to look at is who's going to provide that service. Because the training is going to be the same, the trucks are going to be the same. It's just they want to see that the town is is buying in and helping to provide the resources. You're not going to get the resources from other communities unless there's a big incident. That's where that one thing on there, um, address your emergency service needs. They're looking for the town to say, yeah, we need one station, or we need two stations, or three stations, whatever it is. Right now, we're looking at one station for Cape Creek. Down the road, that might change, but the town has to take care of their own primary resource of needs first. Yeah. Jim, just a point of clarification for the gentleman in the first row. The uh, city of Phoenix has said they do not want to participate as a contract. City of Phoenix said they don't want to contract. Scottsdale said they're not interested in contracting with Cave Creek or Care Creek. They said initially Care Creek, Care Creek is still talking to the town managers and talking, but both Phoenix and Scottsdale said we're not looking to expand. Right. Um, Daisy's well, not looking to compliment the gentleman on a unique idea. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting <laughs> prospect. But they they have said they didn't want to do it. And but but to your point, if, if everybody says no, then we're getting back to the town of Cape Creek Fire Department. Well, we're doing right. master contract. Well, we're we're doing a master contract. We're going to do it. Daisy has not said no. 
they just said, yeah, we've been willing to sit and talk to you, and we've had those discussions, preliminary discussions, and we're going down that road. So we would we would need Daisy to help us get into the automatic aid system. Otherwise, it's going to take us a lot longer. Yeah. Say we go down the route, we buy a fire station, we staff it, we buy all the equipment, and we get turned down for it automatically. What's the next step after that? There would have to be a specific reason why you got turned down, and then we would just address whatever that reason is. So it's 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 fixable rather than a flat no. Yes. Yes. It's fixable rather than a flat no. That's what this is. And, and again, on the back table is a two page sheet of the minimal requirements to get into the automatic aid system. And so if the town does all that stuff, which was given to the council up front, here's what you need to do in order to do this. And I think I said, and not to go down that road too far, but I think I told the council, if you don't want to do anything on these two sheets, then let me know now, because then it's a waste of everybody's time and money. You, it's not negotiable. Getting into the automatic aid system is not negotiable. You have to do the parts of the contract that it requires. And so that's that was given up front. And so the council did come back and say, yeah, we think we should be in the system. If we think we get more benefits than impacts. But there's no case where you do everything and they still say no. They, um, Rural Metro has asked to be in the automatic aid system. And Rural Metro was told they can't be in the automatic aid system. It's for a governmental um, agreement. The challenge is several challenges. One is they haven't done everything that's required to get into it. And they've had a lot of years to do that and they haven't done it. Um, they just asked recently, you know, within the last six months. Um, and then they still haven't done everything that would be required to get into the automatic aid system. And they asked for the entire county. And, it's and so then the second part of it is um, they haven't figured out how to do it with a private for profit company versus a governmental uh, organization like the automatic aid system. But that wasn't my question. My question was, I would, I would not like Cave Creek to, to go down this whole path and spend you know, $5 million sure. the first year sure. and do everything that's required of us and then get told no anyway. Um, again, if, if they did, it would be a very specific reason what you needed to do. Um, Daisy Mountain just helped um, Black Canyon City get into it. It did take them, what, a year and a half or two years, guys, for um, Black Canyon City to put in the radio infrastructure and all the stuff that needed to happen to get in, but they're in. They did it because it's very specific if you do it. And if you're working with a, a automatic aid partner, like another governmental entity, you're going to get in. So you, what you're saying, I don't know if that's ever happened. Um, and I've been here a long time. And I don't know if you guys can help me. I don't know if there's ever been a department that applied and was told no and wasn't able to fix it to get in. I don't believe there has. But what I can tell you is that the Central Arizona Life Safety Council, Central Arizona Life Safety Council that regulates who's in and who's out, the gate gatekeepers for the state. Uh, we met last week, last uh, Tuesday we met. They are paying very close attention to the Cape Creek carefree areas and are very excited about the movement specifically in the town of Cape Creek uh, and are looking forward to the progression of the fire service in the town of Cape Creek and the inclusion of the automatic aid system. If that helps. So who, to follow up, who's, your, who's in charge of that? It's the Central Arizona Life Safety Council. The Central Arizona Life Safety Council is the fire chiefs from all 20 plus departments that are part of the agreement. Okay, those are the, that's the council. There's an executive committee of that that takes the initial requests or not requests and moves it forward to the bigger group. Everybody that's in the the council has a vote. Okay, so there's 20 sub people that vote. The executive committee right now, and it changes a little bit, but right now it's the chief of Phoenix. The chief of Mesa, which are permanent sites, um, seats on that, and then it's uh, I think it's Glendale and Chandler and the Tempe. It's I think two East Valley, East Valley, West Valley. Um, there's five on the executive council. So the initial request to the executive council. I've spoken to the executive council. Daisy's spoken to the executive council. They understand what's happening up here and what has happened up here. They're the ones that started those initial letters saying. You're impacting our system where you need to do something. Okay. So um, I'm not aware of what you're talking about has happened. Like I said, even even the 
um, Black Canyon City was able to get in with the assistance of the Aging Arm Institute. Yeah. So I, I can't, again, I don't have a vote. <laughs> I'm not a fire chief, but I can't imagine. Did I turn that again? Sorry. I, I can't imagine, other than the rural metro request that I talked about. So, yeah. I don't know, maybe you can answer this, but uh, Salt River asked to join that Life Safety Council and was denied, and they've never been put back in there. Because they didn't meet the requirements. But they have the funds to be able to make those requirement changes. They, so it's, it's a, it's not a, it, you, the process in order to join the automatic aid system, as Chief Ford explained, is not a process in which you ask and then get granted a timeline in which you have to comply with the requirements. The, the automatic aid system wants partners, equal partners in the system, and as a part of that requires you to put the effort in on the front end to show your, your value to the system, right? So uh, G4 Scottsdale, when in 2005, when Scottsdale came into the automatic aid system, they were granted a small window of opportunity to uh, allow Scottsdale to go from a three person staffing in some of their stations to a four person staff. As of recently, those automatic aid agreements have been rewritten to specifically say that you have to comply prior to asking to be a part of that system. And that's why some of the agencies like Rural Metro have been denied because they just haven't met the training requirements or the, the radio requirements or the, the uh, automatic vehicle locators. Uh, their command staff hasn't been trained. Uh, I, I just thought of one situation where uh, AFLA, Arizona Fire and Medical Authority, has not been included in the automatic aid system in Tonopah. The fire district has not been able to train all of the folks that came over in that transition. So the town of Tonopah is not included in the automatic aid system. However, the rest of the district that they cover is. And uh, another short example would be um, Real Verde, not, not uh, Fountain Hills, but Real Verde is its own fire district. Real Verde is an island. Real Verde is dispatched by Mesa, okay, but they're not contiguous to the rest of the system, so they can't be in the automatic aid system. So they're dispatched and they're on a full mutual aid request with Scottsdale, Crown Hills, and Rural Metro. So Real Verde, but they, they're not contiguous and that's the biggest thing you have to be part of the system salt river again i'm a little bit familiar with salt river is they do have the money to do this but they have not met the minimum requirements for their community remember we talked about what are your what's your risk to the community with the commercial and everything they're putting up along pima road and the hazmat and everything else they're not meeting the initial requirements that they need to meet to be included in the system but i would agree with you they do have the money but they're they're not spending it. They haven't indicated to the system that they're going to spend it yet. Yeah. So this point, gentleman's point over here. If they use the as your contractor, it's not okay for us to have all of our stations in and your station out. We're going to work with the town to make sure that everybody's in. We want everything our way to be the same and fluid, just like it is in the town. So it's just it's not okay for us to. Uh, they don't meet the requirements. It's, it, that's okay. Have you been asked for a proposal? Pardon? Have you all asked them for a proposal? We're working on it. We're still working so, on it. Yes. That's one of the reasons we're doing this. We're letting everybody know. Well, right. around. But, but they haven't at this point said, hey, just in case, what would you guys need to take over Cape Creek? You haven't been asked. That. I think oh, no, we've we had don't. some discussions with Chief Ford and the staff about what it would initially take, the, the initial startup uh, equipment, stations. Uh, personnel, uh, we've uh, yeah, we been, have we've been working. We have had those discussions, and we had those discussions with council. So we know Scottsdale, no, Phoenix, no, Phoenix, no, Daisy Mountain, maybe, probably, probably, and yeah, and, and again, that's that's the stuff that was presented to council when we went through the budget process. Yeah, so I'm not gonna yeah, I'm not gonna ask them to for put aside this money if there, you know, there wasn't any indications that we could move forward with that. I'm sorry. Doesn't it help their whole system if they take in Gate Creek? That then becomes an asset to them. That's true. That's the automatic gate system. That's the reason. And that's that goes all the way back to the initial letters I was talking about. 
you know, we're, we're not going to keep participating in this and keep sending resources. You can't hire your farmer by a day for major incidents. Okay, that's kind of what happened. Yeah, the town did pay. They did pay off some money for that. But everybody says we're not in that business to rent out our firefighters per day unless it's to the state. The state does that on the bottom of our ground and not for community. So if this scenario takes place, it does mean the station. Given that yes, you would have the station yes. more than one, initially one, and then we'll, you'll have to evaluate it. And I've been around a long time. You have to evaluate on response time, you have to evaluate on risk, you have to evaluate on available resources. So, those are down the road. We're not, you know, we have to look at that, and the council has to look at that. I probably won't be here for that because I'm an old you know, guy in a yellow shirt up here. <laughs> but, but the town will have to consider that, and that's one of the considerations as we go forward. What's your current, what's your future plan? But, but, but it is the one station what you would need today, generally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's, I just put this up here just as a reference for you. And there's maps like this on the back again. You've got your Cave Creek and Carefree stations. And right now, if, if there's a fire in Cave Creek or Carefree, it's Royal Metro. And you got an engine company with four guys from Cave Creek. And you have an engine company with three guys from, from Carefree with a two-person ambulance that gets up here. So that's five. And then a battalion chief, that's 10 people. And remember what I said you need to have for an initial structure fire? 16. So where's the next resource coming from Rural Metro if they don't ask one of the regional automatic aid? The next resource is coming from Rio Verde. The Rio Verde Drive, that's the next one. So that's a, you know, another engine company. They would probably ask for mutual aid, but then you're, again, you're getting into mutual aid with the, the three surrounding communities, Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Daisy. You're, you're asking for help. It's optional if they come or not. If it's a life safety issue, like I said, they're probably coming. If it's a big issue, they're probably coming. But they were very clear that they're not going to come in the same amount of resources unless something changed. They'll send one or two engine companies and a battalion chief to help stabilize the situation. And then you'll be done. Again, you can look at those letters if you want to. If we become part of the auto aid mm -hmm. situation and Carefree does not, how does that? impact us, I guess. Then Carefree would still have to reach out and probably sign a similar agreement. Can you help us for mutual aid if you're available? And if you do, what will you send us? That's another whole discussion. But another whole discussion if they don't. That's why Carefree is looking at the same thing also. You know, they're they're currently under a master contract, but they understand that that's, that would be a one station island again for them. So they have to look at that. Um, what their, check, their decisions are, I don't know. They, you know, again, we've talked to them a little bit, but they have some decisions to make. Yeah. Do you know if the ambulance that's currently housed over in Carefree is committed to that? Does it stay there 24 7 or do they send it elsewhere to make trips for other profit centers? Or? It's that is um, assigned to the desert mountain or uh, desert foothills area, um, but it can respond to Barton Lake. It can respond to North Scottsdale if they need assistance if their units are tied up. Um, it can respond to Cape Creek and Carefree primarily in the county areas in the North Park. Daisy Mountain has ambulances that, that respond to the Daisy Mountain Fire District initially. Um, in theory, they can go back and forth, but they don't respond. Um, and it's, I mentioned this earlier, there's a difference between your fire service and then your transport service. The transport service is set up by the Department of Health Services and it's controlled by the Department of Health Services. It doesn't matter if you're Daisy Mountain Fire with a, a fire ambulance and if you're Rural Metro with a fire ambulance or if you're Maricopa ambulance or your AMR ambulance, it's all controlled by the Department of Health Services. You have to have the approval to work in a certain area. It's called a certificate of necessity for the area. For this area out here, the certificate of necessity for ambulances currently is Rural Metro and Maricopa. So we do have options if we need if we need to go that way on other ambulance services. But there, everybody, every ambulance contract with the state does have to say if you get into a, a tight spot or you need assistance, you have to have a backup system in place to call additional units. Now, what is that? Is that an air ambulance? You know, if it's a major car accident or what major trauma is that, you know, what happens if you have um, an ambulance, let's say you, your ambulance up here is transported to John C. Lincoln or is transported to Desert Valley, you know, you have to have, be able to have others that come in and do it. 
but that is assigned to this area but it's not it doesn't have to stay in this area i guess is one of, does that answer your question yes yeah. make sense? question this might be obvious but i'm not clear is if this takes place and the daisy mountain deal works out and they staff it and all that mm -hmm. does rural metro cease operating on some day is there a cutover where you say as of this day that's all still to be discussed based on the contract and when it will start and when we you know even if, if we do contract with daisy or if we're talking they still have to find 15 people. It's 15 people to cover an engine yeah. company. They have to hire 15 guys. What does it take? Back up from a start date, whatever start date you want to say, back up for a 16-week academy, 15-week academy. I get that long every time going, guys. And and say we have to hire these guys. We have to train them, and then we have to get them in our system before that. So there's some time ahead right. of that. It's gonna take a while. It's, you, you're not hiring firefighters for a one-year contract, or you're, kind of, you're hiring firefighters for a 20 and 25-year career, and so you have, you have to understand that that's a detailed process, and that that's a commitment on that organization. And it's the same thing with Carefree. If Scott said in Carefree, they have to do the same thing. 15 people that they have to find. They don't have them sitting on the shelf. They don't have those guys. So you need to go find them. And so that's a big deal. Those are those are big commitments. That's why this is such a detailed discussion. This might be too detailed for here, but I, I have a property in the city limits and one that's a county island with the Cape Creek address. Okay. And so I'm wondering, in the city limits, we get protection, but now the one that's not in the city limits, would rural metro still be there? Is kind of what I'm asking. As, you know, as long as they decide to keep serving the area, there in operation. it's up to them to serve that area. Yeah. yeah. So their station is their station. It doesn't. This station wouldn't become what they're using today. The current rural metro is their own station, unrelated to what you create or you kick them out. <laughs> I can't say that. I can't. I, I can't. Um, if rural metro have to decide that they want to stay in the area or not, and we have three options that we've been talking with the council about on getting a car station, and so um, those final decisions haven't been made yet. Okay. And so I, I can't tell you that. Um, but it is whatever happens if if K Free says we're taking this over and and we're going to say contract with Daisy, then everything in K Free would be protected with that. It's it's basically a master contract. Right. And right. That's what we do there. Are you saying that the the fire station here now in K Free does that belong to K Free or is that a rural metro? It, no, it's leased by rural metro. It doesn't belong to rural metro either. So who owns that? A uh, gentleman from Care Free owns it. It was a former car wash. I think it was formerly Bubbles Car Wash or something like that. Bubbles. Yeah, I, and that's really bad. You put the car guys in a bubble. They don't it's still own it. <laughs> they don't still own it. Did they the stewards? No. Okay. That's who built it. Yeah, no, they don't. The stewards don't still own it. There's another gentleman who owns it. And so um, we've been talking with him also. So all of these options would be that's what my job is to go through all these options and, and give the town the best option. So, um, but yeah, no, there's a, a private owner that owns that station. There's a private owner for some vacant land, and there's a private owner for another piece of property that would, would work if we don't want to talk to them anymore. So that's, those are discussions that we have to have with the council. When you were talking about EMS, you, um, if we're part of this auto aid, let's say there's a big event that's taking place down in someplace south of Phoenix. Or Mesa or something like that, and our guys have been called down there. What's the EMS provision since 70 or 80 percent of their calls seem to be, you know, medically related? What gets what gets covered? In other words, like now you call me EMS and fire trucks show up because mm -hmm. that's who shows up. That's who's got the training. If the fire trucks are down someplace, who? Well, they're not all going to be gone. That's the that's the advantage of the system. So they're not. You know they'll they'll move the other people in if they say we need the station from Cape Creek to go to I'll make something up let's say we're going to a vehicle rollover on 34th and Cherokee Highway okay then the other units from this area you know, the Phoenix unit that's just south on Cape Creek and Cape Creek Road and the Scottsdale unit they will back up those units um, a major event I'm trying to think of how far this would go south the biggest Rush fire, you guys correct me. One of the bigger ones that happened in Phoenix was just only at the Domax and Cape Creek Road by the, the dam down there. They had that about two years ago. Yeah. 
and uh, we had Scott sitting in this area that went and assisted. I don't know that this would even get down there or not because you have all the other ones you can bring from, from other areas first. So for other major special events, and I know this like for Scottsdale, when we do the Bear Jackson and we do the Phoenix Open, those are major events. We we put on as many people for the Saturday at the Phoenix Open as we have covering the city because we don't want those events to impact the services of the community. So when that stuff happens, and that's what the town can do too, is say, okay, for rodeo days, we're gonna do this. Let's, let's make sure we put an additional ambulance up here for rodeo days or something like that. That's how you do that stuff. And that's how everybody does it. They, if you have a big event that you know is scheduled, you can do that. Otherwise, it's gonna be up to the dispatch center and communication center to move the people around to give you the proper coverage and safety. Yeah, Jim, just to touch on that too. So Dayton Mountain, we have a battalion chief that's on duty 24 seven that's watching these big events that take place, right? So if we know that the Cape Creek engine is going to be gone for a long period of time, we might move another day to the unit into that station for you know, that coverage or what they're constantly kind of monitoring and doing those types of things. We'll also ask the system, hey, can you send some units up as, as a backup? To, and they'll come, they'll sit, and they'll live right in the fire station for a period of hours while, while we're dealing with this. And that's what I was talking about the recycle fire. Our trucks for half a day went over and sat in downtown Phoenix Station. And then we fell down a little bit. Jim, another point too on this slide that you have here, you know, I think it's worth talking about the 24th and Cloud Station that, yeah. that doesn't exist right now. Right. And this is part of the mutual benefit for, for Daisy Mountain Fire District to talk about this because that, that area is on our east side that we currently don't have good coverage for. And that's the west side of Cape Creek that there's no coverage for. And so that's, if we have the potential here, what we're talking about is sort of sharing the costs of, of managing that station from our district and from the town side. Yeah, and that's the advantage of the automatic case system. Like I talked with Glendale and Phoenix, I haven't got to that yet, but that's that's the potential for our west side, their east side. You don't need two fire stations again out there, but you'll probably need one. And put one, one out there, and it, again, it supports the system. It helps bring out more of the system, more resources. So again, uh, these are all the ones that are in the area. So right now, if, you, or if you're part of the automatic aid system, we have something happening in Cape Creek, the Cape Creek. Then you got two Phoenix stations and Daisy stations that are close, plus the Scottsdale station. You don't have to wait till Rio Verde. You got the units are coming. From, they're already there. These stations are already there. The units are already there. The resources are already there. Does that make sense? Not make sense. So again, one-time capital startup cost. The town doesn't have money. That includes property. That includes stations. That includes fire trucks. That includes personal equipment. Um, that includes your radio system, your infrastructure, which is another part of the automatic aid. Do you have the radio structure in place? That will all be up front. Um, and then again, if you have those, if the town has those in place, then it's a much different discussion with Daisy or anybody with Phoenix, just like Curtis Alley did with Phoenix. They had the station, they had the radio stuff, they bought the equipment. They were able to go to Phoenix and say, hey, what are you going to charge us to staff this? And that's a similar thing. The Cape Creek would have resources. You're not just doing a contract, you have resources. And then your annual ongoing costs, again, that's, that's including all your payroll and all your benefits. And what does it cost to operate the station? What does it cost to be dispatched every year? You have to look at all that stuff and say, do I have enough money and do I have enough capacity in our budget to make that happen? So here's... Here's the original numbers that were given to the council. <clears throat> Keep in mind, again, the two different things. Capital items, this is a saving. Can the town take from savings to buy this? These are the initial numbers that uh, came out of what it would cost. Dispatch, just to put the packages in the station, whatever station that is, is gonna cost you for the radios and the, the system is gonna cost you a little over $250,000 <laughs> just for the equipment. Then you have your fire station costs, you have your station furniture, you have your equipment, you have a fire engine you need to buy somewhere in the neighborhood of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. You have to equip it with all the EMS and fire equipment that you need. Command vehicles, employee training. It's forty five hundred dollars a piece to put your guys in the in the academies. Okay, you're using their resources again. Forty five hundred dollars a piece. The turnout gear, the protective gear. Okay, it's it's going to be <laughs> uh, ten thousand dollars each for two sets of turnouts because the firefighters now. The cancer are about seven, six, seven times more than the regular people. So we're, we're going to a fire in turnouts. We're taking it off. 
cleaning that out, we're putting on a different set of turnouts for electric clean so we can protect our floors. So that's why it's two sets of turnouts now. So that turns into 150. So this is this is taking this out of savings. This is capital. This is we're gonna write you a check, we're gonna do that. Is the is the engine uh this uh you call it aerial ladder? Does that include it? No, this is just an engine. You don't, how many high rises do you have up here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have any yet, right? That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah. no, let's, let's not get one. No, except, we need, except we needed two just a few years ago. But if you're part of the automatic aid system, they're coming. Yeah. Scottsdale Station right over here on Pima has an area. Phoenix has an area. So you're getting those resources when you need them. But Cave Creek doesn't need to have an area. Tolleson needed to have an aerial because of their industrial site. So they had to buy an aerial for Tolleson, like I talked about earlier. Cape Creek wouldn't. Cape Creek needs an engine, and Cape Creek will probably need something down the road, like a brush truck, maybe a water tender. You know, the other stuff, that's that's more the risk up here than the, than the aerial. You know, a brush truck or something along those lines. This is just to get us started. This is, can we cover what we're doing now and get us started? So that's what this, that's the capital. That's, that's me reaching into the council's pocket and taking their savings. I'm still here, so it's not been too bad yet so far. <laughs> but, but that's me. That's me impacting the council. This is what it costs, and it estimates on what it's going to cost every year. Once you do this, again, you're not doing this for one year. You, you're buying into the system. You're saying we're going to do this or we're not going to do it. But your dispatch charges, it's, you're, you pay to Phoenix based on the number of calls you have. So it's going to be right around $80,000 a year to be dispatched. And then they maintain the system for you. They maintain the radios. Again, the firefighters, I think I said this the last time, and a couple of your guys gave me weird looks. They said I could put a firefighter in a padded room with an anvil and they'll break the anvil with no tools. So we'll break stuff. <laughs> firefighters will break stuff. They'll break equipment, they'll break some furniture as they, as they use it because that's their second home. They're there 24 7 and that's their second home. So you have to put in some money to replace those types of things. Your vehicle equipment, your fuel costs, all that stuff that you have to put it in there. Your manpower and staffing, if you have turnover, you need to replace those firefighters. And so that's what it is. Um, you might put in, well, the manpower cost is about. <coughs> Again, I talked about 15 people. It's not just four every day. You have to have relief. Those guys get vacation, they get sick, they get hurt. So it's about $2 million a year for a four person engine company for 15 people. Okay, and that's that's gonna change every year too also. It's gonna change what are, what are the benefits change? What are the pay scales change? That's gonna change every year a little bit. So you gotta understand that. Um, employee training, four or five new employees. You better have some money in there in case you have to train it. Your turnout gear, if you have one major fire, you could end up taking out the entire crew's turnout gear. And I only put in for three new sets of turnout, but you could have, you could wipe out four sets of turnout in one fire if those guys got in too far and you know, right over the head. So you have to have some money in there. And you have to have some money in there for you know, EMS equipment, things like that that might or might not break. So you have to have that in there. And then the contingency is like we talked a little bit earlier, Paradise Valley. They just done it for 15 years. They just signed a new 20 year contract. They put contingency money in there because you can't figure out what's going to happen every year in the emergency services. You just can't. So you better have some contingency money in there to do that. So this is about what it's going to cost every year to start. Okay. To start, that's your first out of the bucket. Buy the, buy the equipment, buy the staffing, buy the service. This is what it's going to cost you. And so, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to be very upfront with everybody and say, again, you can do it or, or not. But so here's how you do. Here's how you go through the process. What's your general fund revenues available? Okay, and then what's your future estimate? What's your general fund going to look like as you continue? Is it going to go up or down? You know, that's that's not for me. That's for the budget folks to figure out. What's your full year funding count for town operations? What's it cost you to run the town right now? And then take that not the capital but you take the operational funds and you add it on top of that and can the town afford that so one-time capital funds isn't an issue right now for cape Creek. I'm, I'm talking a little bit too much to council you put your tomatoes away council people <laughs> you know <laughs> but the one the one-time capital hasn't been a, a big challenge but that big of a challenge for us the ongoing funding is more of a challenge so 
what is your annual revenue and where can you get can you make budget adjustments to look at that stuff do you need to increase sales tax do you need to increase property tax what do you need to do is there grants now we're a fire department we have a fire department id number for cave creek that i got when we first got here so we can start asking for grants up until now we couldn't ask for grants so if we were to do it, not the first station, but if we were to do another station, for example, we can ask for funding for that station for maybe three years worth of uh, staffing. We can do that stuff. We weren't able to do that because we never had a official fire department ID number. We have that now for Cape Creek. That also allowed us to enter into an agreement with the Department of Forestry and Park Service for the big air tankers. Those are the guys that, and you know, we can call for them all we want. And Phoenix and Daisy and Scottsdale can all call for them, but it's still up to the Department of Forestry and Park Service to assign those big air tankers that you saw flying over and bombing your house. That comes from those guys. It comes from those guys. But we have that agreement. We didn't have those agreements before I came out here in December. None of that stuff was in place. That's what we've been trying to do. You know, I know, uh, oh, I know rural America was private, but do um, you know how this two and a half million a year compares to you know what they're paid by all the citizens? Okay, you know. <coughs> yes. Okay. But can you tell me? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll show you what I what I figured out. I mean, um, I'll just jump to that right now. So, figuring out that the town has to address the revenue source, revenue stream somehow. I looked at it and said, okay, what would it be for $2 million a year, which isn't the whole nut? But let's say that, as I mentioned earlier, the town has the opportunity to take revenue from different sources. Unlike Daisy, who has to do everything off of property tax, okay? Town can take it from different sources. So if we wanted to do two, and I, I just made this up, it's not, you know, don't, <laughs> don't run out and say that. This is what I said, if we've got $2 million a year to at least have a consistent base, what would that be and how would that compare? Just to your question. So these are all actual homes on the west side. This was the, the report, the town budget for the, the uh, the uh, financial folks that's the average for the town but those are all actual homes in the town those are the year they were built there's a square footage so from here this way doesn't change okay that stays consistent no matter what okay so what changes is what is your options if you go into the fire district if you get one to daisy mountain for every hundred dollars it's 349 for a hundred dollars of a limited property value limited property value is set by the county not set by the town, it's by the county. So they have to do that, but that's the only way they can get revenue again. So it's, it's you know, it's appropriate. That's an appropriate rate. And it's for everybody in their district. Everybody in that district pays the same rate. You don't get some here because you're closer or further away. You really have to pay that same rate. So this is what it would cost a year in, in property taxes for Daisy. This is what it costs you a year in, in subscription if you're a rural metro subscriber for that same house. And then for $2 million, this is what it would cost if you were, if the town of Cape Creek decided to do that. So you would be charged less than what the current rural metro rates are. Everybody in town, but you're getting money from everybody. Everybody has their skin in the game. Everybody's supporting the system. But the other, the only other difference is, and I'll get your question in a second. The only other difference is, um, this is right, you can write it off the taxes. You can't write any of this other stuff off. So you can actually write it off as a, as a property tax. Mm -hmm. they, I don't see your calculation there for raw land in Cape Creek. And it, it, uh, the reason why I keep coming back to it is because I think that there's been a, a bigger free ride than the residents. Free mm -hmm. ride. Mm -hmm. And I really think, I, I want to know, did you get your equation to work for the $2 million based on the residences, or did you get it for the assessed valuation for the town limits? The two million dollars is for the assessed valuation of the entire town, so it includes commercial and includes raw land. Raw well, land. It does. It includes everything. That's that's. So we could have a calculation on this chart that shows the raw land contribution. Yeah, I don't know how to figure that out. I don't know how to figure out the commercial one. I just know that's what they tell you when you talk to the finance folks. They say if your total revenue that you want to get is two million dollars. This is what it's going to cost you for the residential, which is what I was trying to compare because that's the biggest that everybody's worried about. But there is a, a fee for um, raw land, and there's going to be a fee for commercial, but it's all rolled into that two million. It's not on top. 
It's not, okay, we get this much from two million from residential, and then we're going to add on raw land, and we're going to add on commercial. That's not how it works. It's that two million is based on the entire assessment of the town. So if you want to go up, you can go up. If you want to go down, you can go down. That's an easy calculation. And I have done that on other, other properties. David, I'm not sure it was clear, and I'm, I'm not certainly clear with me. With Daisy Mountain, uh, with the uh, Rural Metro, we get an assessment for the house, and we get a separate assessment for a lot that we've got. So we are assessed for lots without structure. But the Rural Metro does an inclusion on some all land that we have, like we have a separate lot next to the house. It's not built separate from the house. It may be. Uh, ours is. Okay. It may be. But, or maybe it's built in. But when I ask about how many people are doing that, we do it because you can't afford hoses, much less to get by the fire on two and a half acres. I, I, all I know is that the residential for Rural Metro will include up to five acres of adjoining raw land. Okay, so if you have a house in five acres, it should be included in your, your initial. I, I think that's if you don't have any division of your five acres. If you have it divided, can I can see what you have? Yes, what? yes, we have we have we have, we have a parcel and then three other parcels and all four are named on the rural metro contract, but we told them about it. <laughs> yeah. So it is possible if we didn't tell them or ask them that it wouldn't be on there. Right. That's that's still voluntary. Yeah. yeah. The bomb, and that's the, the biggest difference. But yeah, that again, just to be clear, that, that two main is the entire assessed value of the community. That's that's what the revenue would get. Now you don't have to do that much. You know, it's up to the again policy maker. They don't have to do that much, or they could do more. They've had both questions. What does it cost to pay the entire nut? What does it cost to pay for half of it? So those calculations are easy and those calculations will be provided. So that does that answer your question about yeah, that's good. the cost? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And again, those are actual structures and those are actual numbers from the county. So here's where we are, here's what, what's happened. Um, and again, you can read this stuff as, as well as I can, but the town council has been very, very supportive of what I've been trying to do. They've been uh, behind me 100%, get the agreement with the Department of Forestry and Fire Service. There's a resolution that the town did. They want to be in the automatic aid system. They adopted that back in March to move forward with what that's going to be. We went through the town budgeting process. Um, you know, the wildland season, I hope you've seen a lot of the stuff we've done for outreach for the wildland season. This is the outreach for the fire service, but there's been a lot of articles in the paper and we sent out some, some uh, community messages for the wildland on what you can do. We did the two different, uh, bring your stuff to the water treatment plant and we'll take the, your clippings and cuttings and stuff for you in February and March. You know, we did all that stuff. We're trying to do all that. Um, and we're still working on outreach. So if there's anything else that we can do to get the word out, let us know. You know, you all have contacts in the community. If you have a, a neighborhood association that you can get 10 people to, let me know and I'll come. There are five people, I don't care. I just want the people to understand what this is and what's happening and then be able to support it and talk about it intelligently. Because there's a lot of, you know, I, I understand this because I've been doing it for 47 years. I've been on the a long time. Like I said, I'm an old slow guy, so I need to hit right now. But, but the other side of it is, um, this is very detailed and it's very, a lot of questions about it. And even, even with the council, I'm going back and telling them over a couple of times, here's what it is, you know, trying to understand. Nobody's had to deal with this out here in the past. And so we're trying to get that information out. So I know it's not going to be just one time, you know, there's going to be other opportunities and I'll be happy to come do it. I'm, I've talked to a couple um, outreach programs already, associations, and I've got a couple more that are scheduled. If you have a group of people, again, let me know and I'll be happy to come and talk to you and your neighbors. And again, open up for questions. Everything I've done has been at council or here like this. It's all it's all open. I don't, there's no hiding. There's no hiding what it's gonna cost. There's no hiding, you know, what the impacts are. It's all it all it is what it is. That's what I'm just trying to tell everybody. Okay. Questions, more questions. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. What is the organization you call the forestry something that brings in the anchors? It's the Department of Forestry and Fire Management. Okay. DFFM. What's the area? That's it. Okay. It's the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. Because I read that in the IGA that we have with it. Yeah. And right now, 
it's not operational unless we have a fire station or in a fire district, so it's of no value. No, no, that's that's not. I accurate. just read it. I know that they have agreed, and actually, there's a they have uh, roving crews that are up in this area for us already. They've got fire prevention crews, and on Monday at the council meeting, I have them showing up with their truck that's on patrol this in this Monday? area this next Monday. Okay. At five o'clock, we're going to show up at town council. So the council, I've been promising the council, I'm going to bring it there for a long time. But they finally got their truck out of the shop again, and it's, it's, it'll be here. So the agreement, they will in writing right now, is not valid. No, it is valid because there's things that you have to do for the state, and there's a lot of things that they want you to do. We did, um, the town did um, put a, a, aside or recognize. Um, excuse me. Drawing a blank, what do you call it when you set money aside? Um, contingency. contingency. Oh, contingency. Fund. The town has set contingency money in case we got to call the air tankers out again. There's an agreement between us and the town that um, myself or the town marshal or the town manager can request those air tankers through the state. Again, they manage that process, but we have the ability to request it. And there are guidelines that you have to have in place, and we have those. So we can call right now, and the state is supporting us on that contract even though the material is different so i need to, i'll ask you yeah you know. yeah we can go through that i can okay. go through that with you but we do have we do have the agreement with the state that they will assist the town because we did a lot of the other stuff I'll, I'm, what i'll do is i'll remind me and i'll give you the letter that i sent to the department of forestry and farm management saying here's all the stuff we did are you willing yes. to even enter into this agreement so, and so with all that that they wouldn't have done it if they wouldn't have agreed with the letter start with, yeah so i'll get you that letter Thanks. if you want Yes. I had a question. It's actually her question, but I'll ask it. What? <laughs> um, what about the <coughs> land that Cape Creek is is coming up in what a couple three years? Has that been taken into account the somehow? An annex land. Uh -huh. um, I don't know what land Cape Creek is annexing, but it'll all it'll all, all be open space. Yeah. Is, I mean, it's on the west side of town. Well, the west side of town is either going to fall into the town of Cape Creek town limits. It's going to be a county area, which is unincorporated, which we'll have to discuss as we go forward on how that's going to be protected. Or it's going to be Daisy Mountain Fire District. So it's going to be one of those three. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if we're providing that protection, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to respond and then we'll worry about that later. But the park, for example, the Maricopa County Park is in the town of Cape Creek. Yeah. So that will be protected. The spur cross is in the town of Cape Creek that would be protected right. and and we could call in the resources if we need to do that. Is that, is that what your question was? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. wanted to be sure that um, there was awareness yes. about that because it's coming up the deadline is David you probably know how many years? Doesn't really matter we're not going to do anything. Well I know but <laughs> Well, you have you still have, you have two county areas. You have a county area north of town that we're going to need to address, and a county area west, and that's either going to have to come into Cape Creek or go to Daisy Mountain. Or, um, in the state, will allow you now to do an individual small fire district for like 20 homes and contract with one of the adjacent jurisdictions. Oh, is that new? That's pretty new. Okay. That's pretty new. We have two in in uh, Scottsdale and Paradise Valley, the mm -hmm. two county islands down there. That those homes have done it, and they will. Sit down and they'll say, hey, "This is what we have. This is our risk. What can you charge us each year?" Mm -hmm. So that's a different, a different deal. How about Cava Springs? Cava Springs is in the town of Cape Creek. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, whatever we do for Cape Creek is going to apply to Cava yeah. Springs. Okay. Right. So that I confuse everybody enough, yes. you know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Did Kelly take away all the tomatoes? I haven't been hitting any tomatoes. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Again, you got to give you got to give credit to the town council because they're looking at this closely and they're they're uh, supporting my efforts to to get the information out. Is there any date of completion set? Like we'll have a fire station by Christmas? Uh, I, I can't commit to a data completion yet. There is nothing we don't have, I'll say currently we don't have any contracts in place, but currently everything is being discussed. You know, that, that all stuff all has to go back to council for 
Right, that's not my decision, but the, the council decisions for contracts. And so I have to go through their process to do that. Is it in executive session or in front of the public? Discussions. The initial discussions are in executive session, but they can't make a motion or action on it until it comes to public. So all of the, all of their actions will be in public. What what the decisions are? Or, With the discussions or not? Well, they can do discuss. They should do discussions in in public also. They that, should. That whole, whole thing right. should come out. Yeah. But they don't. Well, again, an individual contract. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but an individual contract is an individual contract. So Yep. A little different question. What, what causes most fires? But, you know, that's really what it's down to, right? Can we stop it? Okay, I didn't tell everybody I didn't feed you this question. You did. I, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Can a, you repeat the question for our Zoom yeah. listeners? The, the, the question was what causes most fires? And I'm, as the former fire marshal for Scottsdale and the Arizona Park Service Hall of Fame for that type of stuff, um, men, women, and children. <laughs> <laughs> that's care. that's the truth. That's what causes most fires. You know, once yeah. in a while you have a lightning fire or something else, but it's it's people doing stuff that they probably shouldn't be doing or doing something wrong. But most of your fires, you, you, it's all your typical fires. You have smoky fires. You have um, you know improper use of matches with kids. You have welding. Well, welding contractors and welding, yeah, contractors and welding is a big deal. Not just here, not just Steve here. Got Steve and Scottsdale and Steve, everybody. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> cutting. It's, it's all metal cutting, not just welding, but it's all of it. And uh, and then kitchen fires. All the kitchen fires is probably the next one. Uh, smoking, smoking, and that type of stuff. It's the normal thing, but it's usually men, women, and children. And how much of that, I don't know if you always know, but how much of it is arson? How much is it someone setting a fire? Not as much in this area as you would think. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, and, and I'll, I'll be real clear on this. There's a difference between man-caused or person-caused and arson. Mm -hmm. Arson's an intentional act. You know, uh, uh, somebody, you know, throwing out matches or throwing out cigarettes. Dragging chains. Dragging chains, all that stuff is, is a man caused yeah. fire, but it's not an intentional act right. to damage your, your insurance. And so that part is, is pretty small. Now, how much of it is intentional or unintentional caused by people is a lot, most of it. Do we know if the feed store was arson or not? I don't know. I think I was turned over to Roman Hill and the sheriffs, and I don't know. I don't believe they've arrested anybody for arson. And I don't know if the investigation is even still open to tell you the truth or not. Chief, would you mind sharing what this recording and others are available on the homepage of the town's website? What's that? Uh, I just want to make an announcement that this uh, conversation that we had today, as well as all the former ones, if you'd like to share this with other people, leading into the next uh, community discussion that's going to be this upcoming Thursday, you can find this recording and the others on the homepage of the town's website. And every uh, former presentation you mentioned that you gave to council is included on there as well. When you pull up the video, it's bookmarked to start just before Mr. Ford's presentation. So, much. so the worst thing Thank you. that can happen to old guys like me is high definition cameras. Did you ever get a cost of the loss? Evaluation from that rocket fuel fire where we had all the structure losses? No, I, look, I went back and looked at the report and they did not do individual losses for individual structures. So we don't know, even though they were state structures, some homes, some. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. And I, I did talk to the investigator and he said he didn't go that deep into it. He just, let, just noted the structures that were lost. So will we never know? You probably never know because what happens in that case is your your primary arson investigator has to make his estimate and then he usually checks back with the insurance company. But in that case, you probably have four to six insurance companies and they're not going to talk to each other and say, yeah, my loss was X amount of dollars. How much was yours? So you can kind of look at it and sometimes figure that out, but I don't think it's going to happen on that incident. Sorry, I'll quit asking. <laughs> I did look. I did try. I did try. I did try. Sorry. Again, thank you for coming today. Send anybody else you know on to Thursday, and, and hopefully this is beneficial. And um, get a hold of me at the town if there's any other questions or if there's anything I was going to send you. 
Let me know, and I will make sure that you get it. And most of the stuff I talked about is in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over, so thank you for putting up for me. <laughs> but I did want to ask you a question. Sure. I live in an area that's incredibly 